Here is what we will cover. Goals of the GIPS Executive Committee, key features of the GIPS standards, historical performance record, compliance, implementing a global standard, and then the nine major sections of the GIPS standards. We will focus on fundamentals of compliance. This is required at level one. The other sections, we just need to know them at a high level. And finally, we will look at a sample GIPS compliant presentation. Goals of the GIPS Executive Committee. It would be useful to learn this list. The first goal is to establish investment industry best practices for calculating and presenting investment performance that promote investor interests and instill investor confidence. Number two, to obtain a worldwide acceptance of a single standard for the calculation and presentation of investment performance based on the principles of fair representation and full disclosure. With increasing globalization, this is becoming extremely important. An investor sitting in Germany, for example, might be considering opportunities, investment opportunities in various parts of the world. And it will be, and it is extremely helpful if investment management firms in Asia, North America, South America, Europe, etc., are following the same standard when reporting their performance numbers. So that's where this comes in. Number three, to promote the use of accurate and consistent investment performance data. To use a simple example that we also see in the quantitative methods part of this course, when an investment management firm calculates return numbers, there are different ways of calculating the return numbers. For example, either the time weighted rate of return can be used or the money weighted rate of return can be used. Obviously, if different return methods are being used, then we cannot compare those numbers. If firms are following the same standards, then they will use the same calculations and it will become easier then to compare numbers. Next one to encourage fair global competition among investment firms without creating barriers to entry. A common standard helps to level the playing field and that's why by using a common standard that encourages fair competition across the world. To foster the notion of industry self-regulation on a global basis. If investment management firms around the world are on their own complying to a particular standard, then that clearly is self-regulation, which is good for the industry. Key features of the GIPS standards. The GIPS standards are ethical standards for investment performance presentation to ensure fair representation and full disclosure of investment performance. In order to claim compliance, firms must adhere to the requirements included in the GIPS standards. Notice the term ethical standards. GIPS, in a sense, connects back with some of the standards that you study in ethics under the code and standards. Obviously, the code and standards make a general remark that the presentation should be fair and accurate. The GIP standards give a lot more detail on how the performance presentation should be made. Key feature number two, meeting the objectives of fair representation and full disclosure is likely to require more than simply adhering to the minimum requirements of the GIPS standards. Firms should also adhere to the recommendations to achieve best practice in the calculation and presentation of performance. So the important point here is that we have both requirements and recommendations. And these recommendations ideally should be followed. Number three, the GIPS standards require firms to include all 
actual discretionary fee paying portfolios in at least one composite defined by investment mandate objective or strategy in order to prevent firms from cherry picking their best performance connecting this back with something we saw in the earlier reading firms should define composites and then every actual discretionary fee paying portfolio needs to be in at least one of the composites this is because performance numbers are reported on a composite basis if a particular portfolio is not included in any composite then the returns associated with that particular portfolio will not be presented number 4 The GIPS standards rely on the integrity of input data. The accuracy of input data is critical to the accuracy of the performance presentation. The underlying valuations of portfolio holdings drive the portfolio's performance. It is essential for these and other inputs to be accurate. The GIPS standards require firms to adhere to certain calculation methodologies and to make specific disclosures along with the firm's performance number 5 firms must comply with all requirements of the gips standards and again we've seen this before either a firm complies with all gips requirements and then can make a claim that it is gips compliant if a firm does not comply with all standards even if it doesn't comply with one sub standard it cannot claim gips compliance historical performance record a firm is required to initially present at a minimum 5 years of annual investment performance that is compliant with the gips standards if the firm or the composite has been in existence less than 5 years the firm must present performance since the firm's inception or the composite inception date after a firm presents a minimum of 5 years of gips compliant performance The firm must present an additional year of performance each year building up to a minimum of 10 years of GIPS compliant performance. Let's make sure we understand this. If a firm decides that it wants to become GIPS compliant and the firm has been in existence for 3 years, then the firm needs to present GIPS compliant performance numbers for the last 3 years. and then every year after that it adds performance numbers if the firm has been in existence for let's say 12 years then the firm needs to present initially a minimum of 5 years of annual investment performance so even though the firm has been around for longer when the firm decides to become gips compliant it needs to present numbers for the last year and basically go back 5 years after that over time the firm keeps adding performance numbers for each year until there is a total of 10 years worth of performance data once a firm has 10 years worth of data then it is optional to present data from time periods before this firms may link non gips compliant performance to their gips compliant performance provided that only gips compliant performance is presented for periods after 1st january 2000 and the firm discloses the periods of non compliance Firms must not link non-GIPS compliant performance for periods beginning on or after 1st January 2000 to their GIPS compliant performance. This means that let's say a company is presenting information in 2014 and it wants to present information for the last 20 years. Obviously, it will then have to present some information from the 1990s. The 
performance numbers from the 1990s can be non-GIPS compliant. But let's say that if the data from 96 to 99 is non-GIPS compliant, then it needs to be clearly disclosed that these performance numbers are not GIPS compliant. Any performance numbers after 1st January 2000 have to be GIPS compliant. Firms that manage private equity, real estate, and or wrap fee slash separately managed accounts called SMAs, these portfolios must also comply with sections 6, 7, and 8 respectively of the provisions of the GIPS standards that, be, that became effective as of 1st January 2006. As we'll see later in this presentation, there are some special features associated with these different kinds of investments. And there are particular sections that deal with the special features. So section six deals with private equity, seven deals with real estate, and eight deals with wrap fee or separately managed accounts. Before moving on to the next slide, I just want to emphasize the two most important points here. One key point is that at least five years of performance information needs to be presented initially. And then that needs to build up to at least 10 years. Compliance. Firms must take all steps necessary to ensure that they have satisfied all the requirements of the GIPS standards before claiming compliance. Firms are strongly encouraged to perform periodic internal compliance checks. In other words, once a firm has claimed compliance, it should keep doing these checks to ensure that all the standards, all the provisions are still being followed. Firms may choose to have an independent third party verification that tests the construction of the firm's composites as well as the firm's policies and procedures as they relate to compliance with the GIPS standards. We've discussed this before. Verification is recommended, but it is voluntary. And if verification is done, it must be done by an independent third party. In addition to verification, firms may also choose to have specifically focused composite testing, also called performance examination performed by an independent third party verifier to provide additional assurance regarding a particular composite. So this essentially is getting into a particular composite in a lot more detail. The effective date for the 2010 edition of the GIPS standards is 1st January 2011. Compliant presentations that include performance for periods that begin on or after 1st January 2011 must be prepared in accordance with the 2010 edition of the GIPS standards. Coming now to implementing a global standard. The presence of a local sponsoring organization for investment performance standards is essential for effective implementation and ongoing support of the GIPS standards within a country. GIPS is sponsored by the CFA Institute and obviously the CFA Institute needs partners or local sponsoring organizations in different parts of the world to help implement GIPS. In Pakistan, for example, the CFA Association of Pakistan is the local sponsor. The curriculum lists local sponsors in other parts of the world. A country sponsor ensures that the country's interests are taken into account as the GIPS standards are developed. Clearly, this is a global standard. So with representatives or local sponsors in different parts of the world who are feeding in issues or concerns related to their country, that allows the global standard to indeed be truly global and take into account the performance related aspect that might be peculiar to particular parts of the world. The GIPS executive committee strongly encourages countries without an investment performance standard to promote the GIPS 
standards as the local standard and this makes a lot of sense if in a particular country there is no standard then it is quite effective to simply follow the gips standards which have been established and are being used in so many other parts of the world from a testability perspective this is important in cases in which laws and or regulations conflict with the gips standards firms are required to comply with the laws and regulations and make full disclosure of the conflict in the compliant presentation in other words the firms can still claim gips compliance as long as they make it clear that in this particular area the law of the land is being followed which conflicts with the gips standard the structure of the gips standards this has been discussed briefly in the previous reading what we will do now is focus on standard 0 fundamentals of compliance this is required for the remaining standards what we will do is just go over the descriptions and that's all you need to know at level 1 fundamentals of compliance Several core principles create the foundation for the GIPS standards including properly defining the firm providing compliant presentations to all prospective clients adhering to applicable laws and regulations and ensuring that information presented is not false or misleading two important issues that a firm must consider when becoming compliant with the gips standards are the definition of the firm and the firm's definition of discretion the definition of the firm is the foundation for firm wide compliance and creates defined boundaries whereby total firm assets can be determined the firm's definition of discretion establishes criteria to judge which portfolios must be included in a composite and is based on the firm's ability to implement its investment strategy this point related to discretion was mentioned earlier where we said that in a composite only discretionary portfolios should be included and if we are saying only discretionary portfolios should be included then clearly we need a definition of discretionary that is the point being made here 